now. Mic check. Hello. There we are. Can you hear me? I'm sorry about that. Uh, all right. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. The show's only going to get better from here. Uh, what a day it was today. Day 16th of the Lori Vallow Daybell trial. We learned the cause of death for JJ and Tylee. Autopsy photos were shown in court, and there were a lot of gory details presented. Uh, tonight, we're going to go through it all. What we learned about the burial sites of JJ and Tylee. We also are going to hear from a forensic pathologist who testified today. Got into a little bit of a fiery exchange with John Thomas, Lori's attorney. We are, as I mentioned, going to talk about how JJ and Tylee died. Um, and the autopsy photos, an interesting thing today in court, only some people saw the autopsy photos while others did not. And in just a moment, I'm going to play you an interview I did with Lori Daybell's cousin who saw the photos. It was interesting what they did in the courtroom. They turned all the screens so that nobody in the gallery, in the audience gallery, could see the pictures, at least most of the pictures. We saw some of them, but the graphic ones we did not see. The jury saw... The audience did not see. But this cousin who I spoke with, uh, a real interesting interview, um, she said she had to come to the trial to basically say goodbye to Lori, her cousin. She said it was kind of like a funeral, just saying goodbye to her aunt, to her cousin. Uh, it was really actually eye-opening interview. So we're going to play that in just a minute for you. We also have a forensic anthropologist from the FBI, Quantico, Virginia, who came out, who studies bones and had some fascinating things to say that I don't know if we've heard yet in the case. And we, of course, will remember JJ and Tylee and Charles uh, who and Tammy, of course. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. Cover of People magazine this week. Did she murder her kids? Inside the Lori Vallow trial. They should just watch this. They didn't need to print this. No, I'm kidding. Um, I actually sat by the People Magazine reporter last week who was in court. I figured I'd show you this. Big, huge spread. There we go. Mother, prophet, killer, question mark. Inside the Lori Vallow trial. And um, this is kind of a wrap up of, of the whole case. There's pictures on there and the surveillance images. Anyway, that's on newsstands, I believe, today or yesterday. Uh, I was at the grocery store tonight and grabbed a copy, and um, it definitely has the interest of the nation watching. I, I do have to say, before I go any further, um, I just have to thank you all for being so kind. Many of you have come up to me at the courthouse or sent me so many emails. I, I don't even have time to respond to all of them, uh, expressing that you're thinking about me you don't need to think about me, but thank you, and that you are following our coverage, and um, that means a lot, because one, it ke keeps me a job, but two, there are days where it's like, oh, got to go to court again, and I have no reason to complain. These prosecutors, these defense attorneys, these police who have been living this for the past three years, think about them. Pray for them, because uh, they, boy, they've done so much. All right, let's hop over to the sketches from today. We have... The witness on the stand, this is the FBI agent Steve Daniels. There's another shot of him on the stand with Rob Wood questioning him. We have the Dr. Garth Warren, the forensic pathologist. He's the Ada County coroner. He does about 200 to 250 autopsies a year. Then we have an image of Lori Vallow, Lori Daybell, as she... As the images were shown, she did not look at the images. She kept her head down, focused on a notebook. And then our final witness, who we just got to hear from for about 30 minutes before it was time to go for the day. She'll be back on the stand tomorrow. This is Dr. Angie Christensen. She's the anthropologist. Pretty smart, pretty smart woman who deals with bones. Um, I sat by the funeral director mortician today in the audience. I hope he doesn't mind me announcing this, but Brian Wood of Wood Funeral Home from Idaho Falls came with his wife to sit in for today. And it just so happened that all of the discussion was about the bodies, the remains, the bones. It was fascinating to hear his point of view because he has actually sat in on autopsies. And he says it's brutal. He says that it is not 
I, I always assumed an autopsy. They look over the body. They might do a few cuts here and there. He says there are full-on autopsies where they remove the chest plate completely and then put it back in the body. And he says it's it's too much for him. And and the witnesses today kind of testified of that. So we'll get into that now. There has been some questions when I tweet and do a do a uh, do my live updates about the the order of the courtroom, about how things are set up. So I want to show you. This is my very basic drawing. I'm going to get out my laser pointer here. Over here we have the judge. Obviously, he's up here. The witness is here. Here is the jury. And there's little screens that are every few stations like this so they can all see the screen here we have the prosecution this is where there's a little box here where that where they question the witness so they're right here Archibald and Lori and Thomas are here so Lori has a direct shot of these jurors and they have a direct shot of her there's a monitor right here where all of the evidence over here where there's a big screen is shown so she can look at the evidence if she so desires. Uh, and then there's also a screen here for the prosecutor. So everybody has a screen. I sit here. There are two rows reserved for the defense right over here. I'm on the third row, normally in this section. The first few days I sat over here. And this is a good seat. You get a good shot of the jurors, but it was kind of hard to see Lori. And honestly... I sit by a plug. There's a plug here and a plug here. Um, and this, this, there's more people over here. I, I kind of like this side, though. That's my side. Um, and that's covered up by the logo. But anyway, uh, so what? This, this is how it's set up. Lori will often, when they do sidebar conferences, all of the attorneys they meet over here or they go in a hallway behind the judge's uh Back here, there's a there's a hallway in some rooms. Now, when they show these images, instead of Lori looking this way or this way, she will often turn her back to the crowd, look this way, and look down in her notebook. So the side of her is still visible to the jurors, and her face is still visible, but I just can't. The people sitting over here can't see, um, and sometimes the people over here can't see. But I was here today, and I saw a juror, I won't point the person out, crying during the autopsy photos. And she was not, she was looking up. She was looking to the side. She was not looking to the screen. She was dabbing tears. This was a woman probably in her mid thirties, forties, probably a mother or someone that, you know, has kids or, or, you know, is around children. So that is the setup of the courtroom. There's also some seats back here. There are three or four rows reserved right in the middle for the prosecution. This is where after witnesses testify, they can sit here. Larry and Kay sit here. Uh, if the prosecutors aren't sitting at this table, they'll sit back here. The, this, there's normally the detectives will sit here, but no one has sat in the defense chairs except their PI, their investigator and John Pryor. But that's it. If someone were there on behalf of Lori, they could sit here as long as they weren't a witness. So I hope that kind of paints the picture of the courtroom. So many of you have had questions about how is it all laid out. I hope that that helps. Okay, I'm going to run through what we, uh, what we heard today, what we learned. FBI agent Steve Daniels talked about the burial sites. Interesting point. He said that the, the death of JJ was very thought out because if you took a body and you put it in the ground, even if it was wrapped in plastic and you covered it with dirt and that was it, eventually that body is going to decompose and the dirt is going to collapse in. And it's possible that wild animals could find the body, could find the remains. In this case, the body was wrapped in plastic, black and white plastic, put in the ground, and then planks were put on top of it, wooden planks. And then three large rocks were put on top of the planks. We saw the rocks. We saw the planks. We saw the body in the ground wrapped in plastic. Everybody did. Then dirt was put on top. And so there was a berm. It kind of came up. They noticed that there was a berm in the area. And that stuck out. The grass on top of the berm was shorter than the grass surrounding the area. So eventually... As the earth settles, that berm likely would have flattened and been equal to the ground. So interesting, thought-out, methodical burial, it appears. 
Uh, the, the contrast from JJ's burial site to Tylee, the special agent said it, you, you couldn't even compare. In fact, I want to read to you what special agent Steve Daniels said at 925. If you don't follow during the day, you can't see that. But I put up um, updates. There you go. So there's 939, 938, 935. I put up updates as we're going on East Idaho News along with my Twitter he said, uh, Rob Wood, the prosecutor, asked Daniels to contrast the differences between J.J. and Tylee's burial site. He said there was a big difference. J.J.'s remains were all intact, wrapped in plastic bags and very coordinated with rocks and wooden planks. Tylee's burial site was, quote, just a mass of organic material that fell apart when the team went to uncover it. Quote, it was such a big contrast for us as a team going from J.J.'s, how precise everything was placed versus Tylee's melted, charred mass, how that was placed in that burial. Tylee died first. JJ died second, a few weeks apart. Perhaps the effort for Tylee was, was too much uh, for them to do it again. My speculation. All right, after FBI agent Steve Daniels finished up, which, by the way, this was his second day on the stand, so we've put up the testimony from him already on East Idaho News yesterday and today. They're up on YouTube. You can check it out on our YouTube channel. Dr. Garth Warren, he's the forensic pathologist in Ada County, Stanford grad. He has all sorts of experience. He does 200 to 250 autopsies a year. During his time in Idaho, he's probably done 1,200 to 1,500. His job is to determine how and why somebody died. If someone dies in a hospital, a coroner does not need to be called. If someone dies outside of a hospital, the coroner is likely called uh, and determines the cause of death. So he described the process of how he determined the cause of death. And then there's, there's a clip here I want to play where for the first time we learned how J.J. Uh, Vallow died. Now, we know how J.J. was found. And I think there has always kind of been somewhat of a hope that um, he was maybe given a drug or put to sleep or something before he was buried or put in the ground. Uh, but that appears not to be the case. And so this is Dr. Warren. I'm going to play a clip and then I'll come back and then I'm going to play another clip from him as he talks about JJ's cause of death. I do want to warn you, I, we're going to get a little graphic tonight, not super graphic. If you want to read all the graphic details, go read the, the log that I wrote today uh, or listen to the testimony because you want to talk about graphic. That was graphic. We're going to touch on it a little. We have to because that's what happened today in court. But uh, I'm not going to get super deep. Just a warning for you. But take a, take a listen to this. Doctor, were you involved in the autopsy of Joshua Jackson Vallow? Yes. Okay. If, if it's okay with you, I'm going to refer to him as JJ from here on out. Uh, when were you involved in that autopsy? On June 11, 2020. And where did that take place? That took place at the Ada County Morgue. Was this the first time you had ever seen J.J. Vallow? Yes. And approximately how long did that autopsy last? It took approximately four hours. Okay. And did you write a report summarizing your findings for that autopsy? I did. Based on that particular autopsy and based upon your education, training, and experience, have you formed an expert opinion concerning the cause of death of J.J. Vallow? I have. What was that? I determined the cause of death to be asphyxia by plastic bag over the head <laughs> and duct tape covering the mouth. And then there's another segment that's other significant conditions. Um, I put bound with duct tape, bruising of the arms, and abrasion to the neck. But ultimately, the, the cause of death was asphyxia uh, by plastic bag over the head, the head and duct tape over the mouth. And 
Okay, so that was the cause of death for JJ. Asphyxia by plastic bag over the head while duct tape over the mouth. I don't know if I've ever heard of cause of death like that. Uh, so after he determined that, he talked about how he made some incisions uh, in the body and did some other testing to determine if maybe there was something in JJ's body or his bloodstream, a, tech, a toxology report. And this is what he said about what was found in JJ's body in the toxology report. Uh, in this case, because of the state of decomposition, there was no blood, uh, there was no urine, and there was no vitreous fluid. So we ended up sending a sample of liver for toxicology, which is considered a good sample to send in a decomposed case when you don't have options for the other. Um, so after after the case was done, um, I essentially had to just wait for those findings to look at the histology, uh, to look and see what toxicology showed. Um, we also did full body x-rays in this case before the autopsy looking for any kinds of uh, bony abnormalities. Okay. Uh, what were the results of the x-rays? The x-rays uh, did not show any overt um, bony fractures or bony abnormalities. Okay. Uh, and you mentioned that you sent off portions of the liver for a toxicology report. That's correct. And did you receive the results of that? Yes. Uh, was there, uh, what did you find in the toxicology report? So uh, in the toxicology report, there were uh, low levels of ethanol alcohol. Uh, there was um, a subset or a drug called uh, GHB, gamma hydroxybutyric acid. Um, there was also a substance called eobromine. Um, and I believe there's also caffeine. Um, do you know what theobromine is? Theobromine is, it can be found in cocoa and uh, tea products. And GHB, uh, what is that? So GHB, uh, gamma hydroxybutyric acid, it, it's a, a drug, or one, it can be a drug, and it can be used for medicinal purposes or recreationally. Uh, for medicinal purposes, sometimes it can be used for narcolepsy. I think at one point in time it was used as a possible anesthetic um, f or for anesthesiology. Uh, recreationally, um, it's often referred to as liquid ecstasy. Um, some refer it to as a date rate drug. Um, so it, what it does, it acts as a uh, depressant on the central nervous system. It, it can give you a sense of euphoria. Uh, it can give you a sense of calming, relaxation. It can increase libido. Uh, it can cause amnesia as well, uh, which essentially would be loss of memory during the time that you hit the substance is on board. Um, so recreationally, it can be used for all of those things. Um, and in addition, GHB is naturally found in the human body. It is predominantly in the central nervous system. And again, like I stated, it acts as a depressant. And it also can be found in lower amounts in the peripheral tissues. Okay. And were the amounts of GHB, uh, how would you characterize the amount of GHB found in JJ Vallow? The best way to uh, describe it is inconclusive. Uh, so GHB was found. So we know through literature, the medical literature, that GHB can be found in tissues, including liver, uh, post-mortem. Um, so it, th there's really n no way for me to tell for sure whether this is just a naturally occurring product in the body that was there, or if JJ was given GHB. Yeah. Okay, so 
JHP is found in JJ's body, along with alcohol, ethanol. They didn't really go into that. Uh, but based on everything we heard, uh, it was inconclusive if, if those drugs p- played any effect on, on his body. Were they naturally occurring or were they given to him before he died? Um, so a, a little bit of a bombshell there. Uh, the cause of death, and there were signs of a struggle. JJ's fingernails. Signs of a struggle. There, there was a bruising on his fingernails. So he likely was trying to fight back whatever was happening to him. At this point, Rob Wood asked to admit around three dozen photos from the autopsy, from just JJ's autopsy. We saw one during opening arguments or, or that first day. I don't know if it was during opening statements or when the detect, when Ray Harmacio took the stand, we've already seen one and I'll never forget it. And Rob would ask to admit these photos. The defense objected and said that they're too, basically it, it, it's, it's too prejudiced to admit them. They're, they're basically so graphic and so inflammatory that to admit them, it's like over the top. Well, Judge Boyce denied the objection. The defense then said, can they be admitted in black and white? And then there was a sidebar and all of the attorneys went to meet with the judge and he came out and he said, I believe the jurors should see the pictures. I don't know if the public should. So what we're going to do is we're not going to show them on the big screen because that, that could basically sensationalize it by putting it on a big screen for all the world to see. We're going to show it to the jurors. No one in the public can see it. But if you're a victim, you can see them after the fact. And as I mentioned, I spoke to one of the victims who saw the photos at the end of court today. And I'll play that interview for you in just a minute. Now, when the trial is all over, all over, and Chad's is all over, all of this potentially as evidence is public record. So if you're really dying to see these autopsy photos, you can go down to the courthouse and ask to see everything. There was one reporter on the bench with me who was very upset that we couldn't see them. I didn't hear anybody else complaining much, but they made sure that all the screens were turned. In fact, the prosecutor's screen is in front of them and the audience sits behind them. They actually turned the screen around and all the prosecutors went and sat on the other side of the table. They really did not want people to see these photos. But the jurors saw it, and I watched the jurors. And as I mentioned, there was one woman uh, on the jury. She was up this. She was like this. She was looking over here. She glanced at the screen. She looked down, and then I saw her get a tissue and start to dab her eyes. Uh, There were other jurors focused intently on their screens. There were some jurors, one, one juror was like this, she was fanning herself. It was kind of warm in there, not super warm, but you know, the, the, the room was heavy. Lori was sitting at her table, turned like this. Pretend that the camera's the screen, writing. I, did, I saw her glance at the screen once briefly, very briefly, look up and then down. Um, I did see at one point I don't remember when. I think it was when they were talking about Tylee. She did grab some tissues and dab her eyes. Um, but, but even during one of the breaks, uh, when they took a break during these heavy moments, she was chatting with her attorneys and telling them stuff. And uh, it wasn't like a, a, an un- unconsolable person. It was someone chatting with their legal counsel. So that's what we saw. Now, Tylee's autopsy was drastically different than JJ. JJ's autopsy, uh, Dr. Garth Warren completed in about a day and it, the body was intact and it was, I don't want to say routine, but it was quote unquote normal. Tylee's body arrived in three bags and it was what was left of her. And I'm amazed, first of all, at what was left of her. Her heart and lungs were still connected, and they had those. And her rib, some of her ribs and the bones, and I detailed it all. Again, I don't want to get too graphic tonight. Her autopsy took one week. 
There was so much to try to put together. Um, and we learned a cause of death for her. I didn't think we'd ever have that. Now, it, once you hear it, you're going to think, oh, that's obvious. But I w they did determine a cause of death. And here's what Dr. Warren said about that. Dr. Warren, based on your autopsy of Tyree Ryan and based upon your education, training, and experience, have you formed an expert opinion concerning the cause of death of Tyree Ryan? Yes. Uh, what is that cause of death? I determined the cause of death to be homicide by unspecified means. Uh, and homicide by unspecified means, does that have a uh, specific definition? It does. So homicide by unspecified means uh, is a term that is or can be used for the cause of death. Uh, when the forensic pathologist has essentially looked at the totality of the case, I including the circumstances of the death, uh, the autopsy findings, and lack thereof autopsy findings in this case, uh, the toxicology, and also uh, based on medical and social records, um, that the forensic pathologist, which is me in this case, um, feels that the, the cause of death was by homicide, but I just can't pinpoint exactly what that was. Most homicides, you can say something like a gunshot wound to the head when the body's intact or a stab wound to the heart. Um, I can't do that in this case. Um, and it should be noted that I guess the, the term um, homicide by unspecified means it, it's widely used in the forensic pathology world. Um, and it's been around for decades, for several years. And there's been published articles about specific guidelines and criteria that you should follow in order to come to that conclusion. Um, so that's where that term comes from. And after he announced that, we went to lunch once he announced the cause of death for Tylee. And when we got back from lunch, he explained the terminology or the qualifications to determine when, when in his industry they should announce that somebody died from undetermined causes. One is like, that. well, I, I can't remember them all, but one is if, you know, the body's left alone or there's a bunch of qualifications. Again, that's in our daily rundown if you're interested in learning that. There was nothing medically wrong with either JJ or Tylee, according to the doctor. Larry and Kay were in the courtroom in the afternoon, not in the morning. I saw Larry and Kay crying. I saw Kay crying and Larry getting choked up. They then showed photos of Tylee. And again, they turned the screen so that we couldn't see some of them. We did see some of the remains, um, but we did not see others. And the... I, I guess I guess the I guess that's all I'll say about the autopsies and the photos. I will say his testimony was about three hours long, and that is posted on our YouTube channel. If you're big into that, if you're big into you know dead bodies and stuff like that, it, it's fascinating. I did learn a lot today, and it, and it helps sitting next to Brian Wood, who works at a funeral home, to talk about you know how there can be bruising on the body and and once you die your blood stops and so the bruise might stay there there was a lot of talk about body decomposition about um there was no blood or urine or or eye i forget what they call it fluid in the eye to test so they tested jj's liver they tested a part of tylee they they sent her her uh um, I forget if it was her part of her liver, some part of her flesh they sent away. But um, then we had an interesting moment. So after all this, John Thomas, the defense attorney, remember his job is to defend Lori and try to poke holes in the witness's testimony. And so he's done this with almost every witness. He goes up and he questions their credentials. Like you went to what school again and when? And you had how much training Help me, help me see this through. So this isn't new. It, it can come across as condescending, but he's trying to, I guess, do his job. So he goes up to this forensic pathologist who, frankly, just did a phenomenal three hours on the stand, 
very clear, very concise, kept attention the entire time. Some of this testimony can get dull, not in this case. Everybody was tuned in on him. The jurors were tuned in. We'd seen these photos or heard about the photos. So I mentioned how we couldn't see the photos. He described each and every photo. That's how I was able to write about it. So my writing is based off of his descriptions. Um, and then we saw some of them with Tylee. So John Thomas goes up and tr starts to prod him on how they determined the cause of death with JJ. And I think this next soundbite will forever be associated with this case. If there's ever a docu-series or something, a podcast or something, this clip might get played. And you can say you he heard it here first. So take a listen. It was asphyxia by plastic bag over the head and duct tape covering the mouth. Right. Plastic bag over the head. So tell me what evidence um, did you collect? Did you collect any evidence um, inside the sinuses? Did you swab the sinuses and pull out any evidence? No. Okay. Did you um, swab the throat or go down the throat somehow and swab anything down there? Yes, we took oral swabs. Okay. And did you find any evidence of uh, microplastics or something that might be consistent with someone being smothered with a plastic bag? Well, I wouldn't expect to find that, but no, we didn't find anything. Okay, so how is it that you're coming to the conclusion that this person was smothered with a plastic bag? Right. So, um, going back, so JJ was found with a plastic bag over his head um, that was duct taped tightly. He was bound. There was evidence of a struggle, and there is no other explanation of why he was dead. So it's a rule out. I wouldn't consider a rule out because there's a plastic bag over his head. Okay, but that plastic bag could have been put over his head post mortem, right? I guess that's possible. Okay, but you're saying that your conclusion is, is that it was done anti mortem prior Correct. to his death. Correct. And that's based on n nothing concrete, just your theory of the way you think the crime may have happened. No. I think essentially that's how an autopsy um, and all the tests, uh, that's why you do all of those things. So you have a person with a plastic bag over their head and it's bound, and you do all the tests and you do the autopsy and you find zero reason for them to be dead then it's reasonable to conclude that that was the cause of death. Okay, but you, let's, let's back up a little bit. When I talked about swabbing the sinuses or swabbing the nasal cavity, you didn't do that? I've never heard anybody doing that in this type of situation. Okay, what type of situation are you talking about? Uh, bag over the head. Okay, so when someone has a bag over their head and they are, and I'm just going off of things I've seen in movies and whatnot, it seems That's like... That's scary. <laughs> That's scary to you? Yeah, the you going off movies. Okay. So, well, you're going off of, uh, off of... My knowledge. Knowledge, okay. So when someone puts a bag over their head and they're trying to breathe in air, is that correct? What, yes. When, how this happens? Yes. Okay. Does, does anything that's inside that bag, does it generally go inside the nasal cavity or inside the mouth or down the throat? I've never heard of that. That's not how it works? No, not with the plastic bag. Tell me how it happens. Tell me how it works. Essentially, the bag put, is put over your head and you can't breathe, and then you go unconscious and you die. Okay. So nothing goes into the nasal cavity. I don't know why it would. What are you breathing in? Air. From where? Nowhere. From That's inside, why you die. From inside the plastic bag? Correct. Okay. So anything that may have been inside that plastic bag that was close to the mouth or nose would have gone inside the mouth or nose? Not necessarily, okay. no. All right. I guess we'll just have to disagree on that. Objection, that's not a question. Sustained. Will we have to disagree on that? I guess we will. All right, thank you. <laughs> that was a memorable moment. Uh, the movie line is what I meant will be used in future shows. So. There was a bit of a chuckle in the courtroom at that moment just to kind of lighten up the mood, I guess. Um, but there were no further questions from the defense. However, they did not release him from his subpoena. 
A lot of these witnesses, when they're done testifying, the court releases them from their subpoena. They won't have to testify again. But the defense asked that he remained under subpoena because they could call him again during the defense portion of the trial. So we might be hearing from him again. Again, all of the testimony from Dr. Garth Warren is on our YouTube channel. You can go check it out. If it's Actually, if it's not up there now, it will be tonight. So just stay tuned. Last witness, before I get to the interview with... Um, Lori's cousin, who went and witnessed the autopsy photos after court today, Dr. Angie Christensen, a very smart woman. She specializes in skeletal remains. She reviewed and analyzed about 100 of Tylee's bones. They sent them to Quantico in Virginia, the FBI headquarters. And um, she described a lot of these bones. What stood out to me today, she'll be back on the stand tomorrow, is that she said that a sharp tool somehow impacted some of these bones and that a mammal, a car, there was carnivore activity on one of the bones. So um, some sort of animal got to part of Tylee. A lot of the bones were charred. They were burned. And a lot of the breakage was in the pelvic area, which she said Normally, when someone, again, I hate to get graphic, but when somebody's body is dismembered, the joints are targeted. But that wasn't the case with Tylee. It was the pelvic area. So that, that's kind of where things got left off. We're going to hear more from her tomorrow. And then she did mention and say she doesn't determine in her department, in her area, what tools were used to affect the bones, but she has a colleague that does. There's a whole nother department that determines what bones were used for what, or what have, what tools were used for each bone, the tools department. So I would not be surprised if we hear from that person coming up. So I mentioned, I want to get to your questions. I know there's a ton coming in. Please keep them coming. I'll get to as many as I can. Before I get to that, um, I want to play this clip from Lori's cousin. Lori's cousin and two of her sisters have been in court f so far this week every day with their father, Rex, who I interviewed. I showed you that interview yesterday and he, or I, maybe I didn't show it here. We posted it yesterday. And again, the victims had the chance after the autopsy photos were shown at the end of the court today, if they wanted to go see them privately with the prosecutor, they could. And so this cousin did with her sister. One of the sisters did not. She did not want to see them. She left the courthouse. Larry Woodcock also went to see the photos. Kay did not. So this is, I caught up with her, Christy Lott, right after she left the courthouse. She has not done any interviews about this case, but she spoke with me. And here's what she had to say about the autopsy photos and about the case. Right after that, you'll hear a clip from her father, Rex. I'm Lori's cousin and so, first cousin. So yeah. You're Lori's first cousin. And yes. what has this week been like for you being here in the courtroom? Um, it's been terrible, horrible, um, good, like healing. It's giving us some kind of, um, what would you call that? Like the process, we're going through the process now and it's, it's feeling better that we're not just sitting and thinking about it ourselves. We're getting our own answers and we're getting to see I don't know and to see that this Lori isn't the Lori that we grew up with like it's a different a totally different person she's not so I can I feel like I'm saying goodbye to her like I'm done with her now I don't have to I don't have to think of her anymore you know it's she's not wow anything to me so it's like a funeral for Lori so, so when you go into the courtroom and see her every day it, do you recognize her as the aunt or your cousin I do like especially when she looks over and makes eye contact and you kind of smile and she does a little mm, and you're like, uh -huh. well, you're, we're here for you, so it's kind of your fault. But it, it's, it's still hard because you still see her, and you think automatically, Lori. So you smile back, and then you're like, wait, I don't like you. You know, <laughs> you look away real quick. And I did a lot of that with Summer yesterday, where we both like we make eye contact with Lori, and then we look away, and we don't, don't look. Because <laughs> you, that's the natural response to smile when yeah, someone smiles back. Yeah, we love her. Like we grew up with her, and she's happy memory you opted so. to view the autopsy photos okay tell I me did. why um i did it kind of in support of my sister because she wanted to also but i i kind of wanted to do it to see for sure like to know in my own head that that was them and they're gone like it's 
like like I said with a funeral like you would do that at a funeral you want to say goodbye to the body and I don't know that we'll get that chance anytime soon we've been waiting for a very long time so memorials aren't the same so I wanted to see it to know that it's not them anymore and what was that like horrific I'm really glad they didn't show those pictures they shouldn't be out in the public people shouldn't have to see that and I'm very grateful for all the people that are going through this process that have to view these things and that are willing to testify about it. Just some of these experts, like they have to spend so much time on these horrible, horrible things. And I hate that for our family that we have to go through it, but that this is rippling into other people's lives. And that's just, it's horrible. So I'm grateful that they gave us a chance to see them, but that they didn't make it public for everybody. I think that was good. Anything you want to add? Um, well, I'll quote my dad, like, thank you so much to everybody. Like, this has been really interesting to see all the people involved. Because you don't hear that on the news. Like, I know you're here and you're covering it. And I know that there's the prosecutor and I know that there's the defense, but I get them confused all the time. Sure. But this is all, everyone's real now. And seeing things, it's just really, it's overwhelming how many people are involved in correcting this kind of horrible thing so and not only that but the followers are from all over the world all over the world uncle rex has been talking about that look there's someone from south africa there's yeah. someone from australia and he's just it's really become more of a positive thing before we were scared of the media and the fallout people have a lot of comments to make about things when they don't know and now that we've been here and seen some of the good things that can come from it it's like okay well everyone's grieving let's all grieve together <laughs> What, do you, what, should happen, what should happen to your cousin, Lori? Um, I hope justice to the best of their ability, like to serve. Like, I don't, I don't know what the options are, but I, I don't think she should be out on the streets with normal people. And since death is off the table, then, I mean, it's going to be up to God what happens to her. And I think that's going to be more satisfying to us than anything that could happen here. What did you think of today? Today was rough. I've been here, this is my third day, and it was the roughest of the three days. Are you glad you didn't have to see the photos? Um, I think I would have been okay with the photos, but since they gave me the choice and I could opt out, I opted out. I was glad, because for a while there, I was barely holding it together. So if I would have tried to see the photos then, I, for me to deal with that, I have to disassociate myself that what I'm seeing is Tylee or JJ. You know, if I put those two together, I can't handle it. Repeat what you said earlier uh, about how this has kind of been um, helpful for you to be here with your daughters. It really has. Well, especially these daughters, well, all four of my daughters, I'm here with three of them. This is how we deal with it. We process, we talk to each other, even though we're long distance, um, we process. So being here together is really a great experience for us being in the courtroom, seeing how it all works, and we just process all we process during lunch. We go back, we had a, a rental house, and we just sat down in the living room and processed in the evening. That's how we try to deal with this incredible tragedy. And you mentioned, we talked yesterday, but you saw comments from all over the world of people yes, sending their well wishes to you. Yeah, and Nate, your, your outreach and the people that respond to you is just such a wonderful, healing part of this. And there you go, from Lori's cousin and uncle. And they have been here every day this week. I think they head home uh, tonight. So they might be back. Who knows? This is how I hope we remember JJ and Tylee. This is probably my favorite picture of them. <laughs> Anytime I get to choose what photo goes to my story, I try to choose this one. I just, I like it a lot. We heard a lot of gory stuff today. We saw a lot of stuff that, you know, hopefully nobody has to see again. Uh, but this is what I hope to remember these two adorable kids by. In fact, this is the picture that's on the cover of People magazine this week next to their mother. Um, it's just a great picture. There's so many beautiful pictures of them like this one. This is JJ. Isn't he a cute kid with so much hair? I wish I had that hair. I, I, uh, the, the memory that was sent to me with these photos, JJ loved to run. He had lots of energy and was extremely fast. 
When he lived in Hawaii, he would take off running like a little rocket, and someone always had to chase after him. One thing that would stop J.J. from his run was if he saw somebody hurt. He had a very compassionate spirit. One day, while running on the beach, he saw a woman with a cast on her entire arm. He ran up to her and, with a concerned expression, said, Oh, in a very sympathetic way, and gently touched her cast all the way up her arm. He was so pure and so innocent. His sweetness is greatly missed. So, JJ and Tylee and Tammy and Charles are remembered. As we finish day 16 of the trial, day 17 tomorrow, we'll hear more from the forensic pathologist, no, anthropologist. We'll also likely hear from the tool specialist from the FBI. And we might be hearing from Tammy Daybell's sister as early as tomorrow. Samantha Gwillem will be taking the stand soon. And then uh, Friday, of course, the, will be another day at the trial. I'm so excited. My wife's coming. She's just going to sit, sit by me. I hope she gets a ticket tomorrow morning. Uh, I've lucked out and got a ticket every day, so hopefully she can. So it'll be nice to have her here, and then we'll be back again next week. So uh, we will have a courtroom insider tomorrow night. And then Friday night, planning to have my wife here with me to give her insights on the trial. And then we'll be back again. Okay, let me get to your questions. Thank you for your patience. We'll get through as many of these as we can. Oh, my word. Okay. Can Lori be called to testify at Chad's trial? She could. However, they're, they're co-conspirators, but she will have been, her trial will have been over by then. I guess if she somehow decided to take a deal, well, at this point, I don't think she will take a deal, but she, I guess she could, but I don't think she will. It's like Chad. By the way, there is a hearing next week for Chad next the 4th of may after the trial ends at 3 30 at 3 45 there's a status conference chad will not be coming to boise for it but the hearing will be held in boise and that's likely when the judge will set chad's trial date so that trial could be happening this year or maybe early next year maybe about a year from now uh so yeah i guess she could be called to testify but I, but maybe not because they're co-conspirators. Like Chad cannot be called to testify in hers. The prosecution cannot force Chad to testify because he's a co-conspirator. He's also facing charges. If he wasn't facing charges, they could subpoena him and have him testify. But because he is, it's too connected. How was Lori reacting during Summer's testimony? It was very emotional. It was very emotional. And I think Lori was reacting how she's mainly acted. Looking down, I, I, I did see a tissue... But I don't. I didn't see you know very heavy tears. Can Lori and Chad talk? What about letter writing? They cannot talk. They're not supposed to talk. Inmates are not supposed to talk to other inmates. That's not to say that if I was in jail, I couldn't call a friend who then has their spouse call my wife, and then we do a three-way call that way. However, all the communication is being monitored. They could also communicate through their attorneys. If they mailed letters, all of the mail is read before it gets to the inmates, so I don't know if the letters would be delivered to them. They'd probably be seized. By the way, I sometimes get letters from inmates, and um, it's stamped on there who it's from, the facility, the jail. Uh, so Often they want to tell their story. Sometimes it's to you know, thank me for coverage. And I've also written inmates in the jail. And I'm surprised how many times I get a response. I have not gotten a response from Lori. Can you please tell me how someone with no job rented apartments in Rexburg, talking about Lori here in Richmond? We can't do that. Hi, Jan from Richmond. I love Richmond. Lived there for six years. Well, Lori actually had income. She had the social security income, about $6,000 a month. And that's what she put on the rental application from what I understand. One of the days of testimony, they showed that or talked about it. So if you're making $66,000, $72,000 a year, she would qualify for an apartment and could say that that was income. Will prosecutors dive deeper? And I, by the way, I don't know if they do, like how deeply they do credit checks and stuff like that. And we haven't heard anything about Lori's credit, so I'm not sure. Well, and one other thing, it's a college town. So there's a lot of students living in that town that aren't making $72,000 a year and still have housing. Will prosecutors dive deeper into Lori and Alex's relationship? Good question, Carla. They're all good questions, but I don't know. Um, I would have thought by now we would hear more from the defense pointing the finger at Alex and Chad. Maybe Lori has instructed them not to do that. 
But there's been plenty of opportunities to do that, to really point the finger at those two. And, and there hasn't been much of that. Maybe they're saving that for the defense. I don't know how deep the prosecutors will dive into how close they were, but they, they actually have done it quite a bit. I mean, they've had witnesses say that Zulema testified that Alex would do anything for Lori. He was called to serve her and do whatever and fully believed it. So it has been touched on and maybe it will go more so. There was one jury, str- are, well, there was one juror struggling today. Are they told not to show emotion? The audience members are told not to show emotion. In fact, when the reporter today was upset when they said that we couldn't see the autopsy photos, he went, he like raised his hands like, what? And then when the, the bailiffs were concentrating on him, like, you know, do no outbursts, nothing. And then they came back and told him, calm it down on the facial expressions. Facial expressions can look like you're leading the witness. The witness can get distracted. The jury can get distracted. And so everyone in the audience is told to keep it real low. No whisperings, no opening candy wrappers. Can't eat my Smarties anymore. <laughs> During the break, I can. Uh, but uh, the jurors, I, I, I don't, they're, they're allowed to show emotion. Now, if one of them had a full on breakdown, there'd probably be a break and the juror would be taken out. And maybe the judge would say, you know, we need one of the alternates to step in. It's amazing that so far there has not been one issue with the jury. We still have 18. 12 of them are going to deliberate. The other six will not. Can you imagine getting all the way to the end and then finding out you're an alternate and your opinion doesn't really even matter? I mean, I'd kind of be bummed. I'd want to give input. And, and they won't know till the end. And, and between now and then, if six have to be dismissed, then you'll know who the 12 are. But that's how it works. Can juror talks amongst themselves in private? They're not supposed to. They're not supposed to. They all go to lunch together. They all stay in a room together on breaks. They go to the restroom by themselves. Um, but they're not, they're not supposed to. The prosecution seems to be skipping around. Do you think so? Is the jury going to be confused? There's a lot of information here, and I could see how confusion could play into it. I think the strategy is such that you, ha- you have to keep their attention. And, and they've done a decent job at putting on a witness who might be kind of dry. Nothing against the witnesses, but talking about the cell phone pings and the towers. Whew. And then you get a real emotional witness like Summer. They had those on the same day. So that keeps their attention. Today, very attention oriented to the autopsy. Um, I don't think they want to put all of the family members up front and then all of the cops at 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 the back end of the trial. You want to mix it up. You want to keep the attention going. At least that's how I view it. That's how I've seen. Um, There has been jumping around and there often is jumping around with the sus, with the, not the suspects, the witnesses. Uh, So yes, but I think the overall picture when it comes to closing arguments, that's when they'll tie it all together. If, if there's any loose ends, summer recorded the call she had with Rob Wood and gave it to Mark means. Was this before or after the jailhouse recording? Um, I don't know. I don't remember when that was. I think it was after. I I think it was after. I don't remember the specifics on that. Cynthia, do you think Alex was paid for his part? Um, he could have been paid. You mean by Lori and Chad, I'm assuming he he could have been paid. I, I doubt it. Um, he actually was the one with a decent job. They showed his bank records. They showed that he was getting paid $4,000, like twice a month, I think. So he had a decent job or maybe it was 4,400 a month. I don't remember the number, but it wasn't like he had a decent job and money was consistently going in his account. He quit his job. He took out a $21,000 loan and then went and bought a ton of guns. So I don't know if he was really after money. I don't I actually don't think he was. He took out the loan to go buy the guns. Do you think Lori recognizes you from Hawaii? Hmm. I think she might. I think she might. Um, I've been told she said a few things about me uh, to, to cops, but um, yeah, I, she might. I mean, she's seen me in the court every time. And by the way, I want to interview her and I'd be very nice to her. Donna, what if anything do you think was on Chad's son's Blu-ray disc? Good question, Donna. That might come into play later this week or it might not. If it was relevant, they'll bring it in. Is Summer speaking to Lori anymore? Tina asks. 
Um, you know, another reporter reported that when Summer left the courtroom yesterday with Lori, she gave Lori a note. I did not see that, but I know another reporter from Court TV said that. Uh, I, I think Summer would be open to talking to her. I, I, I mean, as much as you can. And I, I don't know how Lori would, would be open to, but, um, yeah, that's, that's what I know about that. Did they thoroughly investigate the daughter's home across from Chad's house? Emma, I think was her name. Jen said that. I don't recall any search warrants ever being issued at Emma's house. We would have known about that. I think if there was anything that they needed from that house, they would have done a search warrant. And I believe that Emma did talk with police. Couple more questions. Christine, is it clear whether or not little JJ was placed in the ground before death? I don't know. They haven't done the timeline with that. I hope that that question is answered uh, because I, I can't imagine how horrific that would have played out if you're buried alive. Is JJ sealed to Charles and Lori? Maddie asks. So I'm assuming you mean sealing in the temple. LDS members go to the temple where they are sealed, meaning they believe that the bond between the couple or the family lasts forever beyond this life. It's not just when death does you does you part, when death does you part. Um, I don't know. I'll have to check on that. I may have heard that at one point or another. I don't know if, if Lori, Lori would have to be sealed to Charles for JJ to be sealed to them. And I don't know if Lori and Charles were ever sealed. So I'll try to find out. Do you think Tammy started to know something wasn't right? I think so, perhaps, toward the very end. They definitely did because that's when she turned dark. But her family, I've talked with her family and they have said that if she did, she never set on to anything, never gave them a clue or anything. Did prosecutors make any comments regarding the recording? Yeah, a month later. Uh, they kind of hinted around to it because they asked Summer about your sister lied to you. She said they were fine, but they weren't. So they didn't specifically hone in on that comment. What's the big deal about swabbing JJ's nose? Defense seems to be a jerk. Well, you heard the encounter there. I think that he was trying to say that if if there was... Uh, <laughs> Maybe that JJ inhaled bits of plastic or something. I don't know. I guess if you were smothered by a pillow or something, there might be uh, fabric from the pillow, cotton in your nose or something. But a bag, I don't know what would be in your nose. So anyway, that's the first time we've kind of heard a witness get into it as much as he got into it with John Thomas. And again, it was kind of the funny moment of the day. And I know it wasn't meant to be funny, but it was memorable. Alrighty, here we go. If you want to follow me, there's my Facebook, there's my Twitter, there's my Insta, and there's my YouTube. Uh, well, not my YouTube. East Idaho News is YouTube. That's where you can find all the video, all the audio. I wish there was video, but all the audio. And again, we'll be back tomorrow for day 17 of the trial, and uh, we should have some news to report. Thank you, thank you, thank you for following along and for commenting and for leaving your questions. I hope this has been informative to you. We'll pick it up tomorrow. Again, if you want all the gory details, go read it on our uh, East Idaho News page or check it out on our YouTube channel. Hope you have a good night. Take care.